I'm Eric Rosales. Tonight on EWTN News Nightly, focus on fairness. Republican lawmakers introduce a bill regarding who could participate in women's sports. Eye on the FBI. Why a Catholic group is considering a lawsuit against the law enforcement agency. Man of Faith. A closer look at the life and legacy of the groundbreaking Major League Baseball player. And channeling the Lord. We remember Mother Angelica, the founderess of EWTN, on what would have been her 100th birthday. These stories and much more tonight. From EWTN, the Global Catholic Network, this is EWTN News Nightly. Thank you so much for being with us. I'm Eric Rosales in for Tracy Sable. Our top story tonight, should transgender biological boys and men be allowed to compete on girls or women's sports teams? Well, the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops and many lawmakers say no. The Republican-controlled U.S. House has now taken steps to preserve women-only sports by passing the Protection of Women and Girls in Sports Act. And women losing titles, women losing Olympic medals, women losing spots on rosters to biological men. Uh, and I think it's time to stop that. Congressman Greg Stubbe authored the bill, along with former Auburn football coach Senator Tommy Tuberville. And it's asinine. And it just, it really makes me mad to know that a group of people like Joe Biden, who 30 years ago actually, you know, pushed an agenda for, for making women's sports better now is totally opposite. They add the Biden administration is adamant about letting biological men play on women's teams and it's causing privacy and safety issues. If there's a girls tennis uh, club in elementary school, if there's a women's basketball team in middle school, those biological men are going to be in our daughter's locker room for these events. And that's just absolutely absurd, frankly. The U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops says it's supporting the bill and is encouraging Catholics to write their lawmakers. The bishops say the bill is consistent with the Catholic Church's clear teachings on the equality of men and women and the truth that they are created male and female. The move is getting praise from other Republicans. I applaud their efforts. Uh, it is so important that women have the outlet of athletic competition to help them grow in both their physical and mental health. Democratic Senator Ben Ray Lujan, a Catholic, disagrees with the bishops and tells me Pope Francis talks about inclusion for everyone. When you look at Pope Francis and how he speaks to us every day about treating your neighbor the way that you want to be treated and, and, and ensuring that people are going to have that that extension of compassion. That's the way we should be. And right now, it's still not yet known if Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer will bring the bill to the Senate floor for a vote. Meanwhile, the Biden administration has already promised to veto that bill should it arrive at the president's desk. They say that it would deny access to sports for many families and is discriminatory. White House correspondent Owen Jensen has more. Eric, the Biden administration says H.R. 734 targets people for who they are. Supporters say the radical left has thrown Title IX to the wayside by allowing biological men to play alongside women. Today, supporters of the Protection of Women and Girls in Sports Act passionately state their case. I am a live and let live person. You can be whoever you want to be. If you want to be a transgender, that is... That's your right. But what about my rights? What about the rights of my daughters? That is where we've lost our mind. And in another fight between the White House and Republicans, the nation's debt limit. Republicans release a sweeping spending restraint plan to offer to the White House, along with lifting the debt limit by $1.5 trillion. When it comes to uh, our, the full, full faith and credit of our nation, to avoid default, that is something that should be done without conditions. That is something that should not be negotiated on. Also today in the White House press briefing room, I asked about the Uyghurs in China. The world promised to never let a genocide like the Holocaust of World War II happen again. We have a, a Holocaust museum right down the street. Does the administration believe there's enough urgency right now in helping the Uyghur Muslims? I think uh, this is the kind of thing, whether it's the Uyghurs or elsewhere around the, the, the world, um, but where we uh, we have to continue to apply constant and unrelenting pressure uh, to, uh, to protect basic freedom of worship and, and human and civil rights around the world. It's not something you can ever let off on, and it's not something that 
you know, we snap a chalk line and say, we're done, and we fixed it, and it's over. It's the kind of thing that we're constantly working at. Meanwhile, earlier at the White House, the President and U.S. Climate Envoy John Kerry hold a virtual meeting of the Major Economies Forum on Energy and Climate. And yes, we're willing to do the hard work to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And he talked about the importance of forests and ending deforestation. Forests are the key to our future. In the United States alone, our forests absorb more than 10 percent of our annual greenhouse gas emissions. And as we all know, if we lose this natural resource, we can't easily get it back. Also at the forum, President Biden announced that the U.S. hoped to give $500 million to Brazil over the next five years to help slow the destruction of the Amazon. That, of course, would need the okay of Congress. At the White House, Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. In other news, a Catholic organization says it is prepared to file a lawsuit against the FBI. Catholic Vote says that it has asked the Bureau for more information about the since withdrawn memo from the FBI Richmond office that appeared to target traditional Catholics. Catholic Vote used the Freedom of Information Act, but it says that the FBI memo is part of a pattern of hostility against the faithful. We go now to Brian Birch, president of Catholic Vote. Brian, great to see you again. Tell us more about the freedom of information requests that you made to the FBI and where do things stand now? Well, thank you for having me. You are correct. We filed this Freedom of Information Act request in early March. The deadline just passed yesterday for them to respond. And it's a strange circumstance here where the FBI and the Department of Justice are not responding to our legal request for documents related to this memo. Um, and now we may have no choice uh, but to file a federal lawsuit in the coming days to get the information that we are entitled to by law. Yes, uh, we, you certainly are through that Freedom of Information Act request. And uh, you accuse the top law enforcement agency of uh, a pattern of hostility against Catholics and all people of faith. Tell us more why, what makes you say that? Well, I think ever Catholics around the United States sense the, the proverbial uh, heat being turned up. Uh, on, on us, whether it be the uh, widespread vandalism against our churches or the disproportionate focusing on pro-life Catholics like Mark Houck, uh, a family man who was uh, raided at gunpoint and forced to endure a long trial in order to exonerate himself. And now evidence uh, based on a leaked memo that the FBI had authorized a surveillance of Catholic churches uh, in order to set tripwires and to gather source material uh, to inform on what they claimed were threats uh, to democracy in the form of recruiting efforts by uh, 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 right-wing extremist groups that apparently, according to some, um, were, were targeting Catholic churches. Definitely so. And you recently called on the Catholic church leaders to speak out against the targeting of the faithful. And what response have you received so far? Well, again, and based on uh, our Freedom of Information Act request, we've received nothing from the government, hmm. uh, and the, their deadline is now passed. You also have a congressional committee that is looking into this, uh, that has subpoenaed the director of the FBI. And then, of course, we have the government's own acknowledgment. Uh, Attorney General Merrick Garland has called this memo appalling, and he has promised an internal review, and we will be certainly holding him accountable to produce evidence uh, that they gather as a part of that effort. And any reaction from church leaders out there? We're certainly uh, hoping for more. We've had a few bishops speak out. I don't know if everyone has recognized uh, the particular gravity of this threat. This is an agency of the federal government uh, who was caught in a leaked memo authorizing surveillance of Catholics attending church. This, in my view, is an unprecedented step on the part of the government. Uh, the, the highest ranking officials that have commented on this have called it um, appalling. And I think ca every Catholic American and every Catholic leader should be demanding and holding uh, this government responsible uh, in getting to the bottom of exactly what is going on. Well, we certainly have to fight for religious liberties and uh, otherwise they simply go away. And, uh, you know, quickly now, we have a few seconds left, but what other stories are you following out there? Well, of course, we have some big votes happening in Congress and in the United States Senate, uh, both related to abortion. But I think the big news story that we're all waiting on is the Supreme Court's decision 
on uh, whether or not they will uphold a lower court's ruling uh, that prohibited uh, the FDA's approval of this abortion drug that has been so uh, disastrous and hurtful to women's health. And we expect that certainly um, any day now. And when that comes, I think there will be big, big consequences across the country, especially for Catholics. Yeah, Judge Alito uh, recently put out a memo on that saying that possibly uh, uh, we'll see maybe Friday is when we're expecting all that to come down. But uh, I got to tell you, Brian Birch, a great, great interview here. President of Catholic Vote, always a pleasure to have you on EWTN News Nightly. Thank you, and God bless you all. God bless you. Democratic Senator Dick Durbin of Illinois blocked Senator Mike Lee's resolution honoring the 50th anniversary of the Heritage Foundation. Now, Senator Durbin said his objection was due to the committee rules and not on the basis of the conservative organization's mission. The think tank in Washington, D.C. is celebrating its 50th anniversary with a two-day summit. Leaders from throughout the country were in attendance. EWTN News, News Nightly anchor Tracy Sable has more. Welcome indeed to what is going to be a momentous week. This morning, Dr. Kevin Roberts, president of the Heritage Foundation, kicked off the two-day event celebrating the organization's 50th year. We're so excited to be here at the Gaylord to bring together over a thousand like-minded conservative activists all across the country to talk about the issues that matter most to Americans. Jessica Anderson is one of the thousands gathered here today to celebrate the important milestone. She, along with other conservative leaders and participants, aim to bring awareness to preserving traditional additional family values and to fight against an increasingly woke culture. I feel like right now culture is kind of lacking a grip on truth and like what's really good and what's not good. And I think um, being able to make that palatable to young people is super important. Also important to those here today, the life issue and defending the unborn. Heritage has been there every step of the way. It's been 50 years of fighting for those values. It's been a tough fight, and I think it's been indispensable for the future of our country that we're still in it and we're still winning. Roger Severino, the vice president of domestic policy at the Heritage Foundation, says the battle continues at the Supreme Court, where a decision is expected on the chemical abortion drug mifepristone, used in more than half of all U.S. abortions. We'll see what the Supreme Court's going to do. Whatever it does, that'll be the first step of this big debate as to whether or not the FDA had the authority to declare pregnancy an illness and treat unborn children as somehow a problem as opposed to something that needs to be valued and cherished. Paul Faraci from Alexandria, Virginia agrees. As Catholics and as Americans, we've got an election coming up. We have to uh, consider how our values are under attack. Of those attacks, the rights of females. The House passed the Protection of Women and Girls in Sports Act today. The White House has said it will veto the bill. It's unfortunate to hear that uh, President Biden is so against protecting women and girls in sports, protecting their opportunities, protecting their chance for scholarship, um, and frankly, equal access to athletics. His decision to come out and say if the bill lands on his desk, he'll veto it. It's the wrong decision. Meanwhile, Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton, who spoke at today's event, says election integrity is one of the issues that he is championing in the Lone Star State. We're trying to pass more significant election integrity legislation to protect our elections, so we're working at it. But if we do not, if we're not successful, it will impact our ability to hold Texas as a fair state and we'll lose the state. But it's not just an issue for Texas. Attorney General Paxton says it's an important issue for all voters. It is a real issue and they should be talking to their legislators about making sure that their elections are fair, free and protected. From National Harbor, Maryland, Tracy Sable, EWTN News Nightly. Social media giant Twitter has lifted its restrictions on so-called misgendering people. This rule had been used to restrict critics on the transgender movement. Among those targeted was a Christian comedy website. When billionaire Elon Musk acquired Twitter in October of 2022, he promised to expand free speech on the platform. Pope Francis has given a relic of the true cross to King Charles III. The gift comes ahead of the coronation, coronation next month in London. There will now be two pieces of the true cross at the front of the king's procession. According to legend, St. Helen found what is believed to be the cross of Jesus in 326 pieces that were later further divided.
And here in the United States, there are relics of the True Cross in seven states, including California, Connecticut, Indiana, Texas, Missouri, New York, and Ohio. The Bishop of Hong Kong is in China marketing the first visit of the head of the Diocese of Hong Kong to the communist country in 30 years. Bishop Stephen Chow arrived yesterday in Beijing for a five-day visit. He says that he wants to strengthen ties between Hong Kong and China. He said that he is enthusiastic about the meeting and hopes that this will be the start of a new relationship. Meanwhile, gunfire was heard throughout Sudan's capital after another failed attempt at a ceasefire. The country reached its sixth day of violence as both sides rule out negotiation. About 300 people have died thus far, with more unaccounted for. The U.S. and other countries are preparing to evacuate their citizens in case of escalation. Well, we still have a lot more to come on EWTN News Nightly, including an original Batman. We remember a famous baseball player who cherished his faith. Welcome back. Baseball fans, listen up. Major League Baseball celebrated Jackie Robinson Day earlier this week. It honored the first black player in the big leagues. Robinson's debut was with then Brooklyn Dodgers on April 15, 1947. And a recent article in the American Spectator examined Robinson's strong Christian faith. Writing in the American Spectator, Dr. Paul Kengor states that in an appearance before Congress in 1949, Robinson called himself, quote, a religious man, and he cherished America because it allowed him the freedom to worship where he wanted. Robinson also was a strong anti-communist. The revelations are part of a new book that Ken Gore was reviewing. And we're now joined by Dr. Paul Kengor, professor of political science at Grove City College and author of the book, A Pope and a President, John Paul II, Ronald Reagan, and the Extraordinary Untold Story of the 20th Century. Dr. Ken Gore, welcome back. Always a pleasure. A lot to discuss. But first, Jackie Robinson and his Christian faith. What other examples do you have? Yeah, thanks, Eric. Good to be with you. And, you know, any excuse to talk about baseball is something that, that, I, that I go for. Uh, but, but it was Jackie Robinson Day last weekend on April 15th, and Major League Baseball first instituted it, boy, almost 20 years ago now. And uh, they did it as a one-time thing initially, at least as we thought, and now they do it every year on April 15th. And everybody in baseball wears his number, number 42, on that date. And, of course, because he broke the so-called color barrier, and, uh, and, and fortunately, too, turned out to be just a, a fantastic baseball player, an MVP, you know, a guy who could, could hit, hit for power, run the bases, steal home even. And you know, one thing that was really, I think, his secret weapon, and my Grove City College colleague Gary Smith writes about this in a great new book on the faith of Jackie Robinson, was his faith. And, and you know, every night, Eric, he said that, that Jackie Robinson said that he would be next to his bed on his knees Beautiful. praying. Beautiful. And I think that's something a lot of people don't know about him. But you know, Ronald Reagan, you mentioned my, my work on Reagan. It reminds me, Reagan had a favorite quote from Lincoln. Reagan said, I'm often driven to my knees by the overwhelming mm. conviction that I have nowhere else to go. And, uh, and that's how Jackie Robinson felt as well. That's what got him through. And Robinson was also a lifelong Republican and a strong anti-communist. What more can you tell us about that? And were his feelings about communism informed by his Christian faith? Yes, they were. And he was called to testify before the House Committee on Un-American Activities in July 1949. And part of the impetus for that was Paul Robeson, who was another great athlete, although it was more known as a professional, as a, as a singer, as a performer. And Robeson was a communist. He was a member of Communist Party USA. And Robeson, Robeson was really bad. Robeson was an actual Stalinist. And you know, I, I, I quote him in my American Spectator piece. People will read that. They'll be shocked, genuinely shocked, at Robeson's admiration for Stalin. But Robeson, Robeson had said in June 1949 that in a war between the United States and the Soviet Union, black Americans would not fight for the United States. 
And, and, and it was just a, a smear against black Americans. I mean, 1949, four years earlier, Eric, you know, how many hundreds of thousands of black American boys had fought for Uncle Sam in World War II? Sure. Exactly. So, so Jack, yeah. So Jackie Robinson came forward and said, uh, he said, no, that, that, now that's not true, right? And, and Robinson didn't say this, but I'll say it. Uh, maybe Paul Robeson wouldn't have fought for America against the Soviets, and he wouldn't have because he swore a loyalty oath to Stalin's Soviet Union. But black Americans would, and so Robinson came forth and testified against communism. Mm -hmm. And a month later, after Robeson made that statement, and Robinson also said why communism was wrong. And, and he referred to Robeson's comments about black Americans not fighting for the United States in a war, potential war against the Soviet Union as silly and untrue. So, so you know, Robinson was um, a great American in many ways, not just as a baseball player, but I would say in his belief in America, in the system of America, and especially during the Cold War. Let me ask you this, Doctor. Why do you think that most of the portrayals of Robinson stay away from his faith or his political beliefs? It's Hollywood. It's Hollywood, <laughs> man. It really is. And and in the in the movie about Jackie Robinson, which in, in other ways is very touching, it's called Forty Two. They completely ignore the faith. Right. They completely ignore the faith, and and you can't do that. I mean, for a man who every night got next to his bedside and knelt down and prayed to God for strength, that that that's the elephant in the living room. I mean, you cannot leave that out of your portrayal. But that's what Hollywood does, and it's a shame which is why um, we need books like my friend Gary Smith's book. We need um, writings. I think the, the piece I wrote for the American Spectator, you know, people need to know. Um, they need to know about the side of, Rob of, of Jackie Robinson. Well, Dr. Ken Gore, thank you so much. Political science professor at Grove City College. Thanks again. Okay. Thanks so much, Eric. Up next on EWTN News Nightly, a perfect 100. We celebrate what would have been Mother Angelica's 100th birthday. Today is a very special day at EWTN. It's the 100th anniversary of the birth of our foundress, Mother Angelica. This afternoon, the EWTN Vatican Bureau organized a mass in Mother's honor. It was celebrated by the Bishop of Birmingham, Alabama. Rita Rizzo was born on April 20th, 1923 in Canton, Ohio. She founded EWTN in 1981. Today, it reaches more than 268 million homes in nearly 150 countries and territories. And joining us now from Rome is Monse Alvarado, president and COO of EWTN News. Monse, always great to see you. Can you tell us more about the celebration and how Mother Angelica was remembered during the Mass? Absolutely. We're here in beautiful St. Peter's Square, and you can see that the pilgrims everywhere here, they're, they're here for their own reasons, but we're here to celebrate Mother Angelica. We just had a fantastic Mass with Bishop Reca in Santo Spirito Parish, and he really told us about her story and how it coincides with today's gospel, this idea that we are called to prophecy to the world, to tell the world about Jesus Christ. So a great way to celebrate her. And I know that I sat down with Michael Warsaw last week, and he said the same thing, that that's what she would have wanted us to do in celebrating her birthday. Most definitely. Mother Angelica has touched the lives of so many people, not only in person, but also on television. And as EWTN News president, how does the figure of Mother Angelica inspire you and your work and mission. You know, first, her devotion to the Eucharist. It's an inspiration for me to intensify my prayer, to deepen my own spiritual life, but also the fact that she wanted to bring Christ everywhere, to the entire world. And so the future of EWTN News is that. It's bringing Christ through every channel that we can find so that people can encounter him through our work. And you spent the last few days in Rome. Can you tell us more after meeting with the uh, Vatican Bureau team out there? The team here, they love Mother Angelica, they love the mission, but most of all, they love our church and Jesus Christ, and they're passionate about what they do. They've inspired me, and I can say that my heart is so touched, and I can't wait to keep working with all of you. It's a privilege to be in this new position. Well, I tell you what, we are lucky to have you. Uh, Monse Alvarado, President and Chief Operating Officer of EWTN News, thank you so much. And finally, tonight, as Monse mentioned, she recently spoke with EWTN Chairman and CEO Michael Warsaw. Part of their interview was about Mother Angelica and how she would want people to celebrate her 100th birthday. 
How would Mother want us to celebrate her 100th birthday? Well, uh, mother, mother never wanted things to be about her, <laughs> you know? So I think that she would want us in this moment of her centenary, I think she would want us to be focusing our attention on our Lord. And the greatest gift that we could give to Mother Angelica would be to go to our Lord, to pray, to do a holy hour, to spend time in front of the Blessed Sacrament, and to deepen our relationship with our Lord. That's the gift that she would want. Amen to that. And you can see more of the interview tomorrow night on EWTN News In Depth. One of my favorite quotes from Mother A was, holiness is not for wimps and the cross is non-negotiable. We want to thank you for watching tonight. Remember, you can follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at EWTN News Nightly. I'm Eric Rosales. We leave you tonight with another look at Mother Angelica, who was born 100 years ago today. Have a good night and God bless.